and here we are. Sticks. Sticks. I thought you said Steve. (laughs) Steve. Steve. It's the Steve song. Welcome to Steve. I'm Phil. And I'm Willow. (laughs) And And it's it's Steve. Steve. Steve talk. Who's your favorite Steve this week? Steve from Minecraft. Steve from Minecraft. What does he do? He builds things. Mm -hmm. And yes. And fights. I don't. The creepers. creepers. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> we know a lot about Minecraft in this household. We don't have to know a lot about Minecraft. We don't have to know a lot about Steve's. Mine is Steve from Blue's Clues. Hi, Steve. Hi. How's Joe? And that the new we guy. We don't talk about Joe. The new guy. I loved Steve. Steve was great. Steve's great. And you know what I love about Steven Burns? I love that he has embraced his baldness. Mm-hmm. He's just completely bald now they make him wear a hat whenever he does blues clues stuff these days but that's just because kids he does he still does blues clues stuff (laughs) he and joe popped on for a cameo to introduce the new guy Mm. uh and so like he but he had this hat on like because he's a detective now in the show like canonically he's created his own detective agency and i think that they put the hat on him because children are naturally terrified of bald men actually i think that uh he quit the show because he was going bald he quit the show because he wanted to do other stuff. He felt that he had tapped know. out his creativity on Steve. Trust me, I know a lot about Stephen Burns. You know, that's fair. I do. Stephen Burns expert right here. And this has been Steve. <laughs> Phil and Willow. Uh, no, it's Sticks. We are discussing Sticks this week. What can you... What Have you ever heard... Sticks. Last week, I made a big deal about the fact that I had no idea what this story was about. And what's the truth? You know all about this story. <laughs> Why? Why do I know all about this story? No idea. I, I mean, you've read it, it and you've done intense research on it, apparently. I started reading it and I was like, wait a minute. I know this story. Wait a minute. I've read this story. Wait a minute. I've read this story recently and also done a lot of research on it. I don't know why. I don't know why. Like, I don't know. I, 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 I was looking up, like, I was like, I got to find further information on it. And I was like, I've read these articles already. I know these facts. What is happening? Like, why did I research sticks? Why did I research sticks? I don't know. I also I also own it in multiple collections. And I was like, oh, look at that. It's just, it's sticks. It's all these, all these stick books. So, um, yeah, sticks. Uh, sticks. Did you read it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very uncomfortable by the long pause you took in between me asking the question and you answering it. I read it a while ago. (laughs) Yes. And I haven't looked at it since. (laughs) Well, then you're going to be the one who fills us in on what it's about. Hey, everyone. I'm Phil. And I'm Willow. And it's Del Toro Toro Time. It's Del Toro Time. Let me grab my book so I can remind myself what the story is. Willow is gonna get a book, is gonna get a book, she's gonna take a look, she's gonna look in a book, and see what the story is about, it's called Sticks, Sticks, and she's back. Oh, shit. <laughs> hi. Well, hi. Well, Hoppa. I just spilled an entire bag of nothings in my bed. Oh, nut thins. <laughs> Fortunately, nut thins are not crum- very crumbly crackers, so you should just be able to pick them up. Say that to all I'm the not- crumbs in my bed. Well, you didn't tell me you also spilled all the crumbs. <laughs> I opened the bag from the side because that's the only way I can open these bags without skizzers. Mm-hmm. So all of the crumbs were on the side. I'll have to vacuum my bed after this. <laughs> That's a good idea. You should probably vacuum your bed once a week anyway. All the shed skin that comes off your legs. Listen, I have eczema. It's natural. (laughs) Hard-boiled eczema. Yep. I'm going to start a disgusting shock horror series called Scrambled Eczema. No. That sounds like (laughs) my absolute nightmare. (laughs) The lashed together framework of sticks jutted from a small cairn alongside the stream. Colin Leverett studied it in perplexment. Half a dozen odd lengths of branch wired together at cross angles for no fathomable purpose. It reminded him unpleasantly of some bizarre crucifix. 
and he wondered what might lie beneath the cairn. It was the spring of 1942, the kind of day to make the war seem distant and unreal, although the draft notice waited on his desk. In a few days, Leverett would lock his rural studio, wonder if he would ever see it again, be able to use its pens and brushes and carving tools when he did return. It was goodbye to the woods and streams of upstate New York, too. No fly rods, no tramps through the countryside in Hitler's Europe. No point in putting off fishing that trout stream he had driven past once, exploring back roads of the Otsilik Valley. You just heard the opening lines of Sticks by Carl Edward Wagner, read by moi, me, Phil. Phil Gonzalez, one of the hosts of It's Still Toro Time. Uh, and this was, this, okay, this was, this was a very specific story. A very specific story. Like, it has a point to make and characters to develop and a plot to tell, and it does it. Uh, it has chapters. It has, and it's not, it's not as long as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Like and it, and it runs, it goes by pretty quickly. The Wagner doesn't stop and dwell on much of anything. It's just like mm -hmm. plot point, plot point, plot point, little character development, plot point. Carl Edward Wagner. What's interesting about Sticks is that in order to understand Sticks, we not only have to talk about Carl Edward Wagner, we have to talk about another guy, a guy by the name of Lee Brown Coy. Do you know who Lee Brown Coy is? Uh, the the anecdote of the great horror. He's a great horror artist. He is a great horror artist. Very famous horror artist. Uh, who in the nineteen early nineteen sixties began including lattice work and sticks in all of his horror illustrations, just seemingly out of nowhere. And when asked about them, he said, "Well, in like nineteen thirty eight, when I was living in upstate New York, I was out scouting around in the woods there, and I came upon an area I hadn't been to, and I saw all this." weird these weird stick sculptures on the ground and then i looked up and there was all this lattice work in these weird stick sculptures and i found this old abandoned farmhouse out there and i went and explored it and more of those stick sculptures were inside there and it stuck with me and years later i went back to find that farmhouse after uh after i showed my publisher those drawings that i had done and he sent the images of the sticks to this archaeologist that we knew. And he told me it might be related to Neolithic cultures and cults. So I went back to find them a few decades later. But that farmhouse was washed away by the water. Does that story sound familiar? So he almost got Blair Witched. He almost got Blair Witched, but this entire story sticks is based on his anecdote. Yeah, I know. It says that in the little paragraph. Which was later find out to actually be probably a made-up story because... The sticks actually started appearing in his drawings before uh, he says the story actually like took like before he says like this actually like, happened. Yeah. So it's uh, there's 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 did he did is this really or is this like a little story he made up like a myth he made up about himself that like Carl Edward Wagner. But yeah, Carl Edward Wagner, best known for the Kane Chronicles, Carl Edward Wagner edited the year's best horror fiction for just years. Carl Edward Wagner, who like our last, uh, who like uh, Michael Shea, is one of those writers that writers really love, but who isn't a household name. Uh, based sticks off of this anecdote, but then he went nuts and went in a different direction with it. Yes. That's how writing works. Uh, I refuse to believe that story is true. Yeah, how come? Because I can't, live in a world where I truly believe that someone is stupid enough to go searching an abandoned farmhouse surrounded by mystery sculptures. I just can't live uh, in that world. Well, I mean, I do know that, you know, according to people who knew him, uh, Lee Brown Coy was supposed to be pretty kind of a, kind of a, just an out there guy, like a little bit of a, a little, a little, a little like super friendly, but also like really intense. Like maybe the kind of guy who would go explore an abandoned farmhouse with a bunch of creepy stick sculptures. No, I refuse to believe it. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that this was very Blair Witch similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Mostly because of the mystery stick sculptures. Mm -hmm. And ending up in like in a weird abandoned farmhouse in the middle of a yeah. wood. Uh, like that is a, did they, did they steal this idea from sticks? Like that has been like brought up. So you are, you're right on. Like, I don't know if they stole it for, for Blair Witch, but it definitely seems like an influence. Well, I mean, if, 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 if these stick sculptures are common in various 
religious practices by people we don't necessarily understand. I wouldn't be surprised if they just did some research and were like, that could be scary. But I don't know if they actually are. I think this is a this is a made up thing. I don't think it would be great it, if it was. It'd be super creepy if it was. Uh, I mean, you know, I have to believe that there's weird stuff going on out in the woods even today. Uh, weird cult. I stuff refuse going to go into the, the woods. woods. I refuse to Why? go into the woods. Well, one, because I don't like going outside. Because you're afraid you may get your wish. What? You're afraid you may get your wish. It's a reference to Into the Woods. Oh. <laughs> we were talking about Blair Witch. I thought you were making a reference to that for a second. I was like, what are you talking about? Blair uh, Witch. What was I saying? I, there are things that I refuse to <laughs> do. You were afraid to, do, to go into the woods. Yes. There are things I refuse to do out of principle, not because I necessarily believe in the supernatural, but because I'm not stupid enough to risk it. Uh, I don't play with Ouija boards. I don't summon demons. I don't hold seances. I don't do any of that thing because I don't want to risk it. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of reaction videos this holiday season uh, of people like first time watching and there's like a ton of them because people are just trapped in their houses. So they have nothing else to do. So all these like, you know, like young gen whatevers are watching these movies for the first time. And one they keep doing is Exorcist. And every time the moment in The Exorcist comes because we watched it not too long ago, historically mm -hmm. speaking, uh, that moment where the mom is like, where'd you get this? And she pulls out the Ouija board. Which isn't like a huge plot point in The Exorcist. It's just like one of the creepy things that kind of leads up to it. Every single time she pulls one out, the the young 20-something who is watching the movie goes, Oh, no! I'm never going to touch one of those things. I'm like, relax, dude. It's Parker Brothers toy. Like, you're going to be fine. <laughs> like, Don't trust fine. the Ouija board. I have used Ouija boards so many times when I was a kid. I am fine. I am Why fine. do you think what all of the awesome? misfortune in your life is happening? I was going to say, what would be awesome is if I said that and then this sword fell down. Like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Sticks by Carl Edward Wagner. Carl Edward Wagner. Seemed like a pretty nice guy. Died uh, in the 90s, I believe. I can't, I don't have that information right off the top of my head. Um, he died at 48. He died in 1994 on October 14th. Yes. He missed the last Halloween. Oh, like, is that bad? Is that sad? Is that sad? Only 16 like, that... days before Halloween happened. Do you think he was concerned about that? I would be. Um, I don't know if he cared. He, yes, he died in 1994 uh, of a heart attack, of heart failure and liver failure. It was, uh, because of, he, he had, he had a, an alcohol addiction for many years. Um, and people were very sad. Tributes to him. Uh, you can still find them floating around the internet. They've been very many published. Carl Edward Wagner, he's a very difficult person to pin down because most of his stuff is so out of print that you're going to spend like $80 for a paperback of one of his books just because you see that's where you're wrong where what am I wrong I'm not spending you're $80 not, on anything. you're book. not gonna okay. <laughs> if you wanted to own most of his most of his writings including his super popular Kane writings like the his like sort of like Conan-esque character Kane you're gonna pay a lot of money for it and he wrote a lot and did a lot of uh editing work but uh but sticks is really easy to come by as we said last week uh it's a zombie novel and a and a uh, Cthulhu mythos novel, um, but not really zombie novel. Uh, maybe in the loosest sense of the term, they do use the term lich a lot in this one. I love liches; they're so yeah. Cool. Uh, the lich uh, goes back. It's a, of course an old old English term for just a corpse. And uh, as far as it being used in the sense of a of a revenant, a person returned from the dead but due to like sorcery, like a person who wants to return from the dead. Uh, you can thank Clark yeah. Ashton Smith for that. Clark Ashton Smith and Robert E. Howard were the two who like started using lich in popular culture. And then, of course, Dungeons and Dragons picked up on that and turned it into a a uh, type of uh, type of character. So uh, yeah, we have liches in this story who refuses to die and uses magic to make themselves immortal. Which is ultimately kind of what this story is about. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a cult who is obsessed with immortality, and but but immortality for the purposes of serving the old ones. Yeah. Uh, they don't actually name the old ones in this, but it is the Cthulhu. And apparently Pantheon. he ended up, uh, Wagner ended up tying elements of this story into his own personal mythos. So it kind of straddles mytho myth mythoses two mythoses uh carl Edward wagner's personal writings and also the lovecraft ones but so what exactly is this story about plot wise colin yes good old colin good old colin he is good he starts he finds i can't 
It's been a while. Basically, what I the, described happened. <laughs> he finds the sticks. Yep. Uh, he goes to war. Does he find the sticks while he's in war? No, he's about to okay. go to war. He has a few days left. It's World yeah, War II, just, by the way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, he goes into uh, the basement of the house, though, where he finds them. Yes, he gets spooked by a lich. Yes, he gets what grabbed by a lich. And he, uh, yeah. and he, br- he brains the lich with a frying pan, which is awesome. Yes, that is, you know, I guess that's what you should probably do if you meet a lich. Right. And I can't remember who it was. I w- I've, I've read and listened to a few things on this story. And someone said that, like, in a and d campaign, like, he starts out, that's like your first, yes, your starter weapon. He has a frying pan. and yeah. And rather than trade it in for a more powerful weapon, he has it, and uh, it comes in handy. It gets him away from his first, his first, his first enemy encounter. It works. This is kind of a D and D campaign. It's very much a like almost a Call of Cthulhu campaign slash D and D campaign mm-hmm. in ways. Yeah, it has like you find mysterious artifacts, you come across an old farmhouse. What do you want to do? Oh, I guess explore the basement. Like it's that, except then it does a major time jump. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah, he returns from war. He doesn't look great. No. He's in really bad shape. Uh, most people think it's because of the war, and he lets them believe that, but it's really because of this experience he had with a dead body grabbing his wrist and him having mm-hmm. to brain it with a frying pan. And that makes sense to me. It makes sense that he would be having problems with that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this is and this is where we do the big time jump. Then it jumps like decades ahead uh, mm-hmm. because he's an illustrator, and he's having trouble selling his illustrations to like weird tales any place because they're too freaky and they're creeping people out. He should write for uh, scary stories to tell in the dark. Yeah, he should illustrate. Or draw for them. Books. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those <laughs> pictures are scarier than the stories. Oh, of course, of course, they're very famous for that. Uh, uh, that's why Guillermo del Toro owns several of the originals. The uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, I think if he was drawing in like the 1980s, it'd be a different story. But in this story, he's drawing a little further back and he's having trouble selling his illustrations. Uh, too creepy. Too many creeps. But then he gets a call or a, not a call because no one's calling each other back then. He gets a letter from Prescott Brandon, who is his publisher or a publisher, mm-hmm. who is going to publish a collection of, of short stories by this guy named H. Kenneth Allard. And yeah. if it ha- if it helps anyone, uh, Prescott Brandon is supposed to be, I think, August Derleth, and H. Kenneth Allard is obviously supposed to be H. P. Lovecraft. Yes. Um, and and that's when Colin is like, "All right, well, I drew, I sketched these creepy sticks I saw a long time ago. I'll start using them in my illustrations and see how that goes. Mm-hmm. And how does it go? It goes not great. <laughs> it goes really great. Well, it Everyone goes really great. Them. I mean, I mean, ultimately, it goes not great, but for the time yeah. being, it's going really, really great. People love him. He starts getting work again. Uh, people want to know more about these sticks. And uh, and Scotty, Scott Brandon, not Scott, uh, 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 Prescott, Scotty Brandon uh, gets has a friend of theirs named Dr. Alexander Strefroy, Strefroy, who is also based on a real guy. Strefroy. Who is Strefroy. Uh, who contacts Colin and is like, I think these things may be related to like Neolithic cultures and cults. Uh, and Don't you just love when in stories people are just like, you know, Neolithic cultures. That's where this mm-hmm. is from. Definitely. A hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Uh, he thinks it may be related to the old ones, worship of the great old ones, uh, and people who are trying to become immortal by worshiping the great old ones. Uh, so yeah, that's not good. You should that's bad. you should consult wait ceremonial magic. Why is ceremonial magic the only two words not italicized here? It's because everything is in italics because this is supposed to be a letter. No, I know. And so, because ceremonial magic would normally be in italics, they've unitalicized it. Well, it looks stupid. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I suggest you consult weight ceremonial magic or such to see if you can recognize similar magical symbols. And they also mention uh, so when he finds the lich down in the basement, it's laying on a on a on an altar with a groove mm-hmm. around the side for uh, like for blood to go into. So it's definitely a ceremonial altar. And yeah, 
And he also includes a picture of that with the letter he sends him. So Leverett is like, whoa, this is a little weird and a little too close for comfort to like what I've been doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's and it's kind of freaking me out. And this is when he goes he goes back to try to find the farmhouse and finds that it's been yeah. washed away by flooding. So uh, oh, a few weeks later, he gets another letter from Strefoy. Strefoy? <laughs> uh, yeah, who's like, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm really bummed out that our good friend Prescott Brandon has died. And, yeah, it sucks. And Colin is like, what? oh no, um, what? And he's like, yeah, Prescott Brandon died. Um, he was killed by people who they think were on drugs. But the book you or, do the illustrations for is great. Or what? Or he was killed by cultists. Or he was killed by cultists. But he's like, yeah, but the book looks great. Shame our buddy Prescott has died. And this is where he finds out that people are now starting to inquire about these illustrations, these weird illustrations. Like he's getting, mm -hmm. uh, Prescott Brandon was being written by people who were like, hey, nice drawings. Where can we find this Colin Leverett guy? And yeah. I guess before he died, Brandon was like, here's his address. I thought Brandon was like, I'm not going to give them your address. Did he not give them his address? Yeah, he says, Your sticks have bewildered a good many fans, Colin, and I've worn out a ribbon answering inquiries. One fellow in particular, a Major George Leonard, has pressed me for details, and I'm afraid that I told him too much. He has written mm. several times for your address, but knowing that you value your privacy, I told him simply to permit me to forward any correspondence. He wants to see your original sketches, I gather, but these overbearing occult types give me a pain. Frankly, I wouldn't care to meet the man myself. I see. I, I forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, he did like accidentally say too much that probably tipped the guy off to kind of where Colin Leverett lives. But it's interesting mm -hmm. that he says um, um, it's Major George uh, Leonard, Leonard Leonard and Leonard. Leonard. And this guy never shows up again. Yeah. He never comes into play in the story. I, I wonder why he was made a major. Like, is this is this a military guy? Like, is this sort of a, a Delta Green thing where like there's there's military organizations that are also interested in the power of the old ones? Or is this just a, a made up guy? Um, well, knowing because... the American military. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could be, or it just could be just a name that I don't know. For all I know, it's another tribute to a, to a, a famous person who is good friends. Uh, Carl Edward Wagner has gone on record as saying that this whole story is nothing but a series of inside jokes. It's, it was actually, he was wrote it on a lark. He wrote it as a tribute to uh, the original illustrator and he didn't expect it to hit people as hard as it did. He was just like, it just went on to become my most famous story. I wrote it as a joke just to to amuse people who were in on the in on the references and it's so for all i know that's an inside joke as well uh anything i don't understand in this story i'm going to assume is an inside joke or an easter egg there by the author and let it go with that um but he does get visited um mm -hmm. by someone who says scott brandon scotty prescott brandon told me where to find you um and this guy says says his name is dana out this guy this i thought it was a woman Oh, no, it's a man. Yeah. This guy says, my name is Dana Allard. I am the nephew of H. Kenneth Allard, um, the guy who you just wrote all these, did all the illustrations for their stories. I found a bunch of his unpublished works. I want to do a prestige format collection of them. I want you to do the illustrations for them. Are you on board? And, mm -hmm. and, and our good friend Colin is like, heck yes. Bring me some more of that sweet, sweet change. Yep. And then he's in space. Then he's in space. Uh, is he really in space, though? No, probably not. Probably, and probably not, not. I mean, no. It's it's a it's a nightmare. Yeah, he starts having nightmares. Well, he starts having visions because later he has another one that ends up being not as much a nightmare as he would be hoping it would be. Um, mm -hmm. But he starts having these these nightmares about this altar he's seen, uh, <clears throat> and then he like wakes up screaming. He keeps seeing the uh, the smashed head of the lich that he that he attacked, and mm. you know. But again, this guy has like loads of PTSD. Probably, I'm not surprised he's having nightmares. Who the hell knows what he had to do or see in World War II? Like, yeah, like as of now, things haven't reached any kind of like point of no return. Yeah. Um, so the book he's he's working on is called Dwellers in the Earth, and uh, it's uh, it's coming along pretty well. Yeah. You also find out later that Colin Leverett has bushy eyebrows. 
So you I know, find. an interesting like little point that he, that, that 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 Wagner feels like it's thrown in there. I, I assume it's a, spe- a a physics physically specific reference to uh to one of his friends. So um so he keeps working with these stick lattices. He gets a letter from Strafoy again. Mm-hmm. He was like, I've been doing some more research on these sticks. Uh, it's terrifying. It's horrible. There's a lot of significance to them. He keeps having nightmares and he finally has a nightmare uh, in which he is led by the lich to sacrifice someone on the altar. And when he wakes up, he's covered in blood and he's holding a half devoured human heart. Yep. And this is the point where he's probably like, this is this is not good. This is the opposite of good. It's bad. This is a yeah. bad thing that happened. Um, yeah. And so he goes to, uh, he says, Leverett somehow found sanity enough to dispose of the shredded lump of flesh. I'm like, how'd you do that, Leverett? <laughs> how'd you do that, Colin? Did he finish eating it? I wonder. He wished he could vomit. It's not that difficult to make yourself vomit. <laughs> I wish I could vomit. <laughs> Probably look at the heart you're holding in your hand. Or think about eating it. That would do it. Yeah, probably. Just think about the fact that half of it's probably in your body. Um, and uh, again, who's this? Who's this boy that he sacrificed? Um, is it a boy? Is it a little boy? No, it's a person. And his name is Doctor Strafoy. <laughs> yeah, it's the st- Straboy. <laughs> it's, it's your Straboy, Alexander. <laughs> Yeah, um, they find that a granite slab has fallen on Dr. Alexander Strafoy um, during an excavation. So I assume that like they took his body and they put it there and they threw a granite slab down on it to cover up what they did. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he kind of puts together that he actually killed, was led underground to kill. Did he walk? That seems like they're not really near each other, are they? Like that's a, that's quite a hike to do in the middle of the night, but um whatever it works uh and then he goes to visit uh dana allard the nephew of the author whose whose works he's illustrating and this is chapter nine and it is uh our final scene and what happens in this final scene uh da- dana is like so uh yeah i'm part of this cult <laughs> and now everyone gets to be part of the cult he's not only part of the cult he is a lich. actually He's actually his uncle. He, oh, yeah, he's yeah, the, yeah, yeah. He's the author. Like, he writes, mm-hmm. he signs some stuff, and that's when uh, Dana Leverett puts together that the handwriting is the same. He's I actually mean, an immortal. Who's Dana Leverett? I mean, sorry, uh, uh, Colin Leverett. <laughs> Colin Leverett puts together that their handwriting is the same. Dana is actually the the original author. He's an immortal. And he finds out that he found this lich of this sorcerer in the basement back in the 30s or back in the 40s. He hit him with the frying pan and put him out of commission for a while. And the cult yeah. was like, what? No, what? No, come on. Now we're not going to be able to call the old ones. And then years later, they see his illustrations pop up and they're like, you re- you remember the lattices? Mm-hmm. This, this what is this guy named? A- Althal? <clears throat> Althal? Althal? Uh, it's, oh, where is it? I have it. It is written Althal it's Althal yeah Althal and what I love about this is it only worked because he used the frying pan because the frying Mm -hmm. pan is made of iron and this guy Althal uh has been trying to do this and has been freaking out about it ever since iron was invented four millennia ago because it's like he's been living forever high on the hog suddenly human beings invent iron and he's like oh dip they can kill me now. I've got to come up with a way to resurrect the old ones. So for 4,000 years, he's been like working on this thing. He's almost ready to do it. He's on the cusp of calling the old ones. This guy stumbles into the basement and is like, <laughs> ah, and hits him with a frying pan and it puts him out of commission. And they're like, well, now we don't have the lattices anymore. And fortunately, he copied in the lattices, starts publishing them. And they're like, we got to get this guy to publish more lattices. Because if we can get him to publish more of these lattices, these stick drawings, It'll like be seen by everyone all over the world. It'll add more power to our to our uh, invocations, and we'll be able to call the old ones down. And mm-hmm. not only that, dude, but Leverett, you're one of us now, brah. And uh, 
And the last paragraph says Leverett turned to run, but now they were creeping forth from the shadows of the cellar as massive flagstones slid back to reveal the tunnels beyond. He began to scream as Althal came to lead him away, but he could not awake. He could, but he could not awaken, could only follow. And he's being led away by the Lich and the Lich's followers through these like apparently subterranean warrens that connect everywhere in America. Um, and that's that's Steaks. That's the way it ends. It is very much like, it is like you said, like it's very, you said D&D, but it's very Call of Cthulhu role-playing game mm-hmm. uh, in that it's it's it hinges a lot on cultists doing the dirty work. Uh, and cultists are a big thing in uh, Call of Cthulhu. And mm-hmm. I think it's a testament to wagner's writing ability that this story held my interest because i'm going to be completely honest with you stories about cthulhu cultists and great old one cultists bore the sin out of me and i don't find cultists scary i don't find them interesting they're usually just brainless followers who have knives in their robes and i i think i was like i like the way they used the cult in this one like not since the call of cthulhu have i really found an interesting cult I think the thing about this story is that it doesn't take itself too seriously, Mm. which I think is why I like it. Because so many times people write about cultists and they do their damnedest to make the cultists scary. Yeah. And I'm like, they're just people. They're just people in robes. That's all they ever are. Mm -hmm. And uh... And in this one, a guy brains a lich with a frying pan. (laughs) I love that he brains the lich with a frying pan. And you find out that that's just like... That almost puts the entire cult out of commission because they're just like, why did he have the frying pan? Like, this is so stupid. What are the chances that somebody would stumble upon our 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 sorcerer lich and just happen to have a frying pan and, and hit him in the head with it? Like, that's just, it's so ridiculous. And then it works. But it's not played for laughs. Like, Wagner rightfully keeps every, he plays everything very straight. And that keeps the story pretty creepy it gets still a pretty creepy little tale um but yeah it went on to uh it went on to be included in like do you think it do you think it qualifies as a zombie story no how why not because liches aren't zombies what what are they they're undead yeah what's a zombie to you to me a zombie is a mindless uh I mean, it depends on the context, because if we're talking right. fantasy, a zombie is a mindless undead servant to a greater being, as such as a necromancer or a lich. Yeah, you're like uh, you're But Haitian if we're talking, so. yeah, if we're talking uh, pop culture, a zombie is a dead thing that is only driven by hunger. Right. It's two two very different things, actually. They're both reanim... Mm-hmm. Not even... Because, re- like, a, a Haitian zombie, like a voodoo zombie, isn't even necessarily a reanimated corpse. It's a person who's been mm-hmm. turned undead. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily they weren't dead before. Like, you can sort of, like, sell your li- your life to a, to a sorcerer. But, uh, yeah, it's this is included in several zombie compilations. And I think it's interesting, like, because it's a good way of saying, like, there's all kinds of different ways to explore the undead. Like, uh, mm-hmm. to tell stories about the undead. And this story is going off of a, of a tradition that is much older than the Romero zombie, the living, dead, flesh-eating zombie. Um, even though these, mm-hmm. these might be flesh they might eat flesh for fun. I can't tell. Like, there's a lot going on here uh but one thing that annoys not annoys me about this story but uh august derleth is the is the editor of of our the old editor of thing arkham house and he's the guy who basically created the cthulhu mythos he created mm-hmm. the term cthulhu mythos he's the one who come like, consolidated it tried to put some order to it even though it doesn't have any order by definition uh and cultists and the great old ones and a resurrecting of the old ones and the serving of the old ones all that is very much a derlethian something he made like part of the 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 the, the culture around these types of stories and mm-hmm. i find that annoying because i like just the weird weird tales i like the whole like the the great old ones are unknowable the uh, cthulhu and all of those characters are just like and this book play I mean, this story plays into that a little bit, but not too much. I mean, let's be honest, if humanity did discover giant unknowable monsters and aliens, there would be cults. There are. There already <laughs> yeah. are. Exactly. For- I do think it's funny though that when we used to think cultists, we thought 
people in robes with daggers making human sacrifices and worshiping old gods. But as has become painfully clear, it is cults are actually uh, lost souls who worship charismatic uh, celebrities and speakers selling their identities and lives uh, with a promise of, they don't even, of a better They don't tomorrow. even need to be charismatic, as we know now. That's true. Uh, they just need to be told they're to, charismatic. You just have to open their stupid fat mouths. You just have to make people feel bad for wanting to be happy. And then you can be a cult leader. Uh, so that is, that is, uh, that's, that sticks, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, this is uh, The Dark Descent. <laughs> uh uh we're reading uh the color of evil uh this is the dark descent by uh by david uh david g hartwell um and uh i feel kind of weird that this was in the color of evil as oh, opposed to definitely. being i don't know it just feels like it would fit better i'm just going based completely off the titles of the uh sections in the fabulous mm-hmm. formless darkness oh well maybe uh the cult is definitely evil mm-hmm I didn't mention that this story originally appeared, first appeared in the magazine uh, Whispers, issue three in 1974. And if you look up Whispers, uh, it is an entire edition of Whispers that is a tribute to the illustrator, Lee Brown Coy. And he wrote this story for that this issue of Whispers. So like th- Lee Brown Coy's artwork is all through this issue. And then this story shows up and like near the end, illustrated by Lee Brown Coy, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. And it's one of the last things in the issue. So you can you can see where like you've read this and looked through this long magazine about this one artist. And then you have this cool little creepy story that's based on this artist. And you're probably just like, oh, that's great. Like, that's fun. That's fun. We have a good time. And and then and, uh, you're paranoid because you've looked at these pictures of these lattices. <laughs> and have you seen them? They are pretty creepy. Uh, if you just look up Lee Brown Coy, you'll see these drawings. And you're like, oh, yeah, these are weird and off-putting. And they don't seem to fit, but... They just make his illustrations seem unsettling and like they're so intentional. Um, but yeah, it was immediately reprinted in a, in the uh, the collection Night Chills, uh, Great Tales of Horror and the Supernatural, The Dark Descent, uh, the re the reissuing of Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos by Arkham House, the mammoth the Giant mm-hmm. Book of Horror Stories, the Mammoth Book of Zombies, the Giant Book of Zombies, uh, and the Book of Cthulhu Two. So obviously, 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 uh, people consider this a worthy addition to many different kinds of horror collections. And uh, I just really wish that Wagner's stuff would come back in print so that I can take a look at it. And, like, I don't mm-hmm. know, enjoy his work. Someone out there, please, please let me know. Is this stuff going to come back into print? <sighs> let me know. So what's our next story? So I'm looking at Lee Brown Coy's oh. sticks. Oh, you're looking at his drawings? They're unsettling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyways, our next story is... Dum, 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 dum. Bum, 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 bum. Uh... <gasps> yeah. Uh... Sorry, going grudge, going full grudge for a second there. <laughs> uh, uh, our next story is Larger Than Oneself by Robert Ackman. Aikman. Ackman. <laughs> <laughs> Larger... Than one's self. Uh, this is another story that I'm going to say I've not read, but I'm afraid I may have. I'm afraid I may have, but I don't know. So we'll find out. Uh, is this a short short story or a long story? It's long. It's a long one. What's funny is that uh, Styx is sometimes referred to as a novella. No. But <laughs> it's certainly not a novella. It's just a longer short story. That's larger than one sections. Yeah, larger than oneself is definitely longer than sticks. Or maybe about the same. Definitely longer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Comparable. my legs are sore. Oh, my legs are sore from all them sticks. It's Halloween, by the way, this Spooky, week. Spooky, scary skeletons. Ah, copyright. <laughs> You're supposed to keep going, but. Oh. I, was, I, was, I dropped a beat for you, and then you didn't keep going. But it doesn't matter because we are so. There's such a delay that it would have just been weird. So, uh. Yeah, so that's this is our Halloween episode, uh, an appropriately spooky, scary story for spooky, scary Halloween. What are you going as for Halloween? I'm going as voter fraud. <laughs> there is, we do need to make some room for a little announcement slash segment. That's right. Uh, before we tune out today, we have a special segment from one of your hosts. 
Did you know that more than 60 million US citizens have already voted? This is in contrast to the 58 million people who voted early in 2016. And there's still time. I myself have voted as of the 27th of October. I took my mail-in ballot to the designated drop-off point and sent it to the wind. Well, to the people who do the voting stuff. I vote. It's important, and it's also important to check the Minneapolis voting website so you can ensure that you are dropping off your ballot in a legal and safe way. Voting is important because it can decide which course of action is the best for our country, whether it be about marriage equality, a clean energy act, or in this case, a person leading our country. Democracy doesn't work unless the people use their voice. Our power is in our collective refusal to allow those in power to do whatever they want. We get a chance to set up the government we want to see, not just the president, but the Senate as well. This election will help us keep in place the government we want. It's more important than ever to get your vote in. Make a plan to vote and join the 60 million of us who already have. Put on your mask and get out there. That was great. Yay, vote. <laughs> vote. Uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, by the time you hear this, I mean, not by the time you hear this, uh, by the time you hear our next episode, election day will have come and gone. Uh, so fingers crossed everyone that we can start making baby steps out of the hellish nightmare that is reality and into some Robert Aikman. <laughs> I'm Phil. And I'm Willow. <laughs> and we'll see you when it's, it's Del, Del Toro, Toro time. time. I can't think of anything. Whenever anyone says Wagner, I can only think about is his name Robert. Robert Wagner. Yeah, and his dead wife. What about? Wait, what? Robert is that Wagner's what his name dead is? Wife? Dead girlfriend. You mean Natalie Wood? Yeah. Like the whole Robert Wagner Natalie Wood thing? Yeah. It's the only thing I can think about. I didn't even know that was like part of your like consciousness. <laughs> What whatever made you think of Robert Wagner and Natalie Wood? Like, Just the last name Wagner. But how do you even know about that? Like I, the, I watch a show called BuzzFeed Unsolved. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, okay then, because you tend to have like zero interest in things like that, so I was very confused. In things like what? <laughs> in things like older pop culture. Well, it's not really pop culture. It's a mysterious death that no one knows It is a mysterious really mystery. She was married to uh, Robert Wagner twice. Did you know that? I know. She yeah. was married to him, divorced him, and then got married to someone else, then divorced that person, then got married to someone else. And yeah, was him. potentially having a confair with Christopher Walken? Potentially, yeah. yeah. For some reason in high school, uh, Natalie Wood, Robert Wagner, Christopher Walken jokes were really popular among my circle of friends. That's not surprising there, to me. We were, there was like, if if anything happened on a boat, there would be like a Christopher Walken p- killed Natalie Wood or Robert Wagner killed Natalie Wood reference. Or if we were watching a movie and Christopher Walken was in it, someone would inevitably say like, hold on, I've got to go push Natalie Wood off a boat. And we would all laugh. <laughs> not very funny or, if you're Natalie Wood or one of her loved ones. Mm-hmm. Or the boat captain did it. The boat captain, the skipper. Mm-hmm. Or he made his because he was Gilligan he's he's freaking sketchy AF. This has been mystery talk with. I love unsolved mysteries. The new unsolved mysteries on Netflix. No. Oh, there's Just a new like unsolved the concept mystery of series unsolved on Netflix. Mystery. You don't. I'm you all don't, about. I'm all about Ryan and Shane, man. Who's Ryan and Shane? They're the people who host BuzzFeed Unsolved. <laughs> oh, gosh. You're just quite the BuzzFeed child, aren't you? That's the only BuzzFeed thing I watch. And the only reason it's still on BuzzFeed is because they have the rights to Unsolved. Ryan and Shane when aren't I... even part of BuzzFeed anymore. They have their own thing. When I listen back to this, am I going to hear a bunch of pages flipping during this part? Because no. I'm seeing a bunch of pages flipping. And I'm going to have to cut all of this, aren't I? <laughs> no.